Hey there, Cousin here, and welcome back to Always Doing. We have arrived at the semifinals, finally. If you are not familiar with the Book 2 Prize, I'll have all kinds of information down below, but it's run by Robert over at Barter Hordes, and it is a literary prize for BookTube by BookTube with a different format than you'll see in most places because we all read six book groups and half of the books from each group move on to the next round. Now that we're at the semifinals, there's two groups, group A, group B, and I am in group B. I have already read three of the books in this group, which was immediate cause for celebration. And if you'd like to see my thoughts on those books, like my full, full thoughts, I'll leave links down below to my playlist with all the vlogs because I read them in previous rounds. But the three remaining books include the two chunky biographies, well, an autobiography and a biography. So even though I'm only reading three books, it's, it's a zillion and a half pages, approximately. So the three books that I already read are After the Last Border by Jessica Goudeau, and this is about refugees coming to America. We follow two in particular, one who's a woman from Syria and a woman from, I think it's Myanmar, and the everything they went through, the whole refugee process, the awful things that happened in their home country, all of their own experiences. And there's also a thread of the history of the refugee resettlement program in the United States through time, not just recently, but back from when it was first established, closer to World War II, and all that stuff. This book I had super complicated thoughts about, and I still have super complicated thoughts about because as valuable as the story is, I feel like it has a bit of a white gaze, pulling heartstrings to make people care in order to do something like to put more money into the refugee resettlement program. And that's all a very good goal and that's fine, but I would have rather seen an author who speaks one of the languages that these women speaks or was a refugee themselves and came to America that way. Someone with a bit more personal experience closer to that. Just the whole, the way she handled interpreters and stuff, it was with a good heart, but there were definitely stumbles and very complicated. I think I gave it three and a half stars, which is a good rating. There's nothing wrong with that. And at the moment, that's probably the lowest one out of the three books that I've read so far. The other two books that I read are on fairly equal footing, and not only because they're about similar-esque topics, but come at them from different directions. One is Inferno by Catherine Cho. This is about her experience with postpartum psychosis. She has a psychotic break when her child is a few months old, and it's all from her point of view and it is well written. It is fascinating. I read it in like a day, which was, um, it was an amazing experience. It's going to be really hard figuring out whether that, like it's neck and neck with Hidden Valley Road by Robert Coker, which is about a family who had 12 children, 10 of whom were boys and six of whom had schizophrenia. And there are struggles and everything. And that one, it's somebody from the outside looking in so that it's completely different from Inferno in that sense. It's not a memoir, it's a biography of sorts. But, and it's extremely well done, but there are so many tragic things that happen to this family that I feel that Coker uses for their shock value and as plot points in the narrative. I'm not quite so sure how I feel about that. So they're both amazing books. I would highly recommend you read both. I'm pretty sure I gave both of them four stars, which for me, I rarely give five. So four is really good. But um, I don't know how I'm going to pick one to go over the other. It's going to be hard. Let's look at the books I haven't read yet, starting with the one with the fewest number of pages, which is Conditional Citizens, which clocks in right around 200 pages. And I don't know anything about this book. When I watch other people's vlogs and wrap-ups of the Booktube Prize, if there's a book I haven't read yet, I skip over that part. Um, unless it was kicked out of the prize and then I'll watch that. So I haven't seen anyone's thoughts about this. And, but if it got this far, it's bound to be good. It's a topic I care about. I'm guessing it's immigration and undocumented um, folks and just that whole thing. So yes, and it's short, which is great because the second book up is 700 pages, something, something. And that is A Promised Land by Barack Obama. I just started it. I'm about 120 pages in and it's good so far. And the longest book with about 940 pages, and I'm doing all these page counts by chopping off the notes, is Red Comet. It's about the life of Sylvia Plath, whom I know very little about. I just know Sylvia Plath equals depression equals bell jar equals death by suicide. That's about it. So it will be eye-opening for sure. The one thing that he, I'm, because I'm, this is the one I'm the least excited about, to be perfectly honest, but some of you in the comments have told me how quickly it reads and how wonderful it is. So that buoys me 
a bit, but it's not where I ended up starting. I got my hands on a promised land first, so we're going there. In life news, we are fully in rainy season now, so it can just rain whenever it wants, and blue sky is a rare thing, but we're making do. And my phone. I am really loving my new phone in general, and the picture quality is better, even though it may not look better after I export it from my video editing program, but to me it looks better. The thing is, though, is I am not happy with the sound. The sound is not... I am so annoyed because how did a six-year-old phone have better sound than this phone? I don't get it. So I'm looking into getting a lapel mic. Um, in Japanese it turns out they're called pin mics, which I think is kind of cute. It's because you hold it on with a pin. Um, so we'll see how that goes. That's not something I was expecting to have to do with a new phone, but there we go. But let's head into the vlog proper, yeah? Look at this head of lettuce. Isn't it glorious? I don't know if it's all gonna fit. I got maybe half of it. That is packed full. The lettuce that keeps on giving. A Promised Land is basically what I was expecting. I mean, it's a presidential memoir. There's not too many ways to break the mold on those. We hear a bit from Obama's early life and him going to law school and eventually organizing, getting into government and of course becoming president through mm, basically, well, the killing of Osama bin Laden. I was not expecting to enjoy his prose this much though. I mean, I've heard that he's a good writer, but to actually read it was wonderful. It's not just the way that sentences come together, but it's his insight. It's his way of stepping back and looking at a situation, um, be it on an emotional level or on a more 10,000 foot level and seeing what's going on there. So like, that was really nice. I like that once we get into his presidency, he doesn't go in strict chronological order, but he lumps things by topic. So he talks about Obamacare in one section, and then he'll talk about immigration bills and this incident and um, Deepwater Horizon, all kind of blocked off, where in reality, they were happening over each other at the same time. And he does mention in parts where it was particularly onerous when it did, very tough on him but separating it out like this made it much easier for the reader to follow. But say whatever you want about him being a writer, he's still a politician. So we have a lot of name dropping. We have a lot of thanking people for whatever they did at this time or another. He uh, doesn't mind calling out some especially high ranking Republicans who did some nasty things to him, which I'm totally behind. He also thanks Republicans who came across the aisle to vote with him, especially on moral issues like the Dreamers Act. One thing I didn't get along with as well is how he rationalizes some things away, uh, talking about how it was Congress's fault or they tried and it just, you know, wasn't gonna happen anyway. Those kinds of things, it, it didn't feel right. At the same time, like he dealt with an extremely obstructionist Congress in his first term, the Senate in particular. And like, I get it, I get it, but it didn't come across well on the page. I appreciate, especially knowing um, more recent events that have happened in Israel and Palestine, looking at his views of the Mideast um, peace process, crisis, whatever you want to call it. I love the early bits. I love hearing what it was like on the campaign trail. I like hearing the stories about his family because he had his daughters completely shut off from the media for most part. So just getting little glimpses of what they were doing while they were living in the, light, in the White House. Michelle has stories I've not read Becoming yet. And this was kind of like, well, you know, I'm probably gonna have to read Becoming now because just reading between the lines here, I know she has so much to say. Even with all the good, I found myself skimming once I learned what I could skim, which was names for the most part. Uh, once it took me several hundred pages to figure out his system, his rhythm. But once I did, it's like, oh, this paragraph gone, this paragraph gone, which helped me speed up. And it made it a little bit more enjoyable for me when I was reading like my dedicated hour a day. I ended up giving this three and a half stars because it's very good. Um, I haven't read many presidential autobiographies or even biographies. So I don't have a good way to rate it within those, but in my own experience, it was good. But this group is super strong and this is not, I can tell you right now, this is not gonna make the top three at all. I don't know how I'm gonna rank them other than like this one's low and that one's high and it's gonna be tough. I love the cover of the New Yorker this week for Pride. 
Look at that. That is gorgeous. And there's so many little things here too. Like we have some trans pride flags, the BIPOC, um, the inclusive uh, queer pride flag. There's even crying in H Mart right there. And yeah, no, this is gorgeous. I'm saving this one. This vending machine has a dumb foreigner guide. What the hell? Base is loaded. Oh, Tani coming to the plate. No pressure. No pressure. Done then. Too bad. Next, I finished Conditional Citizens, and I don't have any clips from while I was reading this because I could not put it down. I had to force myself to put it down on the first day that I picked it up and I finished it the second day. In these essays, Lalami looks at what it's like to be a conditional citizen in the US, which is someone who has a passport, is a citizen, but people take a look at them and don't think they are. It could be because they're black. It could be because they're brown. It could be because they're wearing a hijab. It could be for many different reasons, but they don't earn all of the social privileges in a way of being a citizen because of something about them that they can't change. The writing is deceptively simple and clear, but you know that it took a lot of work to make it seem that way. And this will weather well. I don't think this will feel dated in five or 10 years. It has that timeless quality to it. The essays act as a cohesive whole and she brings the perfect amount of personal anecdote to this, to illustrate points and to say how things have affected her. And while I was reading this book, I was thinking, this is what I wanted from After the Last Border. I wanted this kind of book to be written by somebody who has lived the experience, who has immigrated to the United States and in After the Last Border been a refugee so that they can bring this kind of percep perception, no, perspective, and insight, which is so valuable. I knew almost everything she was talking about from the Kavanaugh hearing and history of immigration in the United States to the demonization of welfare and so many other things, but it never got boring. It never got stale because of her writing. She has some zingers. For example, what I want is freedom, not better conditions of subjugation or coexistence should not be a passive state. The chapter about immigration, assimilation, and integration in particular spoke to me because I am an immigrant. I have been living in Japan for over 10 years now. And it's an experience that while you know, as a white woman coming to an Asian country, it's very different from what she went through coming from Morocco to the United States, but commonalities abound. And if I may quote her again, even under the best of circumstances, immigration is a traumatic experience that cuts a person's life in two. There is the life before and the life after. And that, along with so many other things in that chapter, resonated with me so hard. So great writing, kept me interested, even though I knew everything she was talking about. I loved hearing about her own experience. This was a very, very solid four-star read. And I have no idea where I'm going to rank it. I hope it makes it into the top three. I think it deserves to be in the top three. That means I have one book remaining, Red Comet, about the life of Sylvia Plath, and... This is the largest book, not only in my group, but in the entire nonfiction section of the prize. It comes out to about a thousand pages. Once you knock off the notes and things, I forgot if it was 850 or 900, but something like that. And I figured it out where I need to read 50 pages or so a day, six days a week in order to finish. And that will give me like a week before the ballots are due in. So I have some wiggle room, which is good. And I'm on my third day of reading it. The first few chapters, I don't know if I was so interested in, except the introduction, I should say. The introduction was amazing because the author is talking about how she is giving Plath her due that previous biographers have given her short shrift saying like, oh yes, like she was a mental case. And she, like, if you look back in her poetry, you can see that she was unhinged from way, way before and like all these other things. And she's like, you just carrying this stereotype of a woman with mental illness and driving it way too far. Um, she did so much research, got access to papers and things that nobody else has had access to. So much respect for what she's done and how she's framing this whole thing. It's much appreciated. But those first couple days, I was just kind of reading through and going, okay. And one thing I'm not appreciating is how she kind of expects you to know a bunch of 
Plath poetry already and I have read zero of her stuff. So she's like, oh yes, this is a very Plath theme to talk about XYZ. And I'm like, well, thanks for telling me, I guess, because I had no idea, whatever. So there's some little bits like that, but now that where I am right now, she is in, she's at Smith College and her life is starting to get more I don't want to say interesting, but she's able to go off and do things. She's not just a kid anymore. So I'm finding this more interesting, but something I realized yesterday is like, okay, I have, this is my third day or fourth day now reading this. I feel like I've read a lot and I have, but I have three weeks minus three days remaining to do, be doing this pretty much every day, except Sunday. So it's going to be long. It's going to be, it's going to be something else. I'm definitely looking forward. The mid month book, book bash is coming up. I hope to blast through maybe a little extra even then that would be cool. Um, a lot of other things I want to read for the mid month book bash too. So we'll see, but yeah, we'll see how this goes. I've given myself a bit of a project. This pothos is doing well. I mean, I have new growth, but it's rather uneven. And then I have one really, really long vine. And I want to encourage it to bush out a little more. So I am going to cut off a whole bunch of these leaves. And I was thinking of potting them in soil. But I was at the dollar store and they had this. It's a gel polymer beads things. You wash them in water. They soak up the water. They have nutrients in them that last six months, it says. And you can plant directly in there. So I thought that would be a neat way to root these and so I got also at the dollar store a glass so let's see how this goes all right so I put blue ones on the bottom and we're doing the rest with clear they bounce like super balls when they get away from me they're actually kind of fun to work with so I have I think I'll try five leaves to start oh dropped one See if I can get them to stand up in here. All right, looks a little anemic at the moment, but hopefully those will root well. And the plant is looking a bit less leggy too, so we'll take it. Sometimes I leave the book that I'm looking forward to most to read last in a particular round. I did not do that this time. I just happened to pick up Red Comet last. The introduction though had me sold because Clark is saying that Plath when has had lots of books come out about her, her life has been talked about so much, but not through a feminist lens. But Clark comes in here and she's saying, we're take, we're gonna look at this at a feminist angle, how amazing Plath was for doing everything she did in the 1950s and 60s, a time where women were not equal, and especially in academia and all the shit that she had to go through to be able to do even what she did. And I was like, okay, I'm here. This is great. This is a lens I can really work with. That goodwill followed me through the beginning of the book, through her early childhood. Her father died while she was still quite young. And um, we learned about some of her romantic, actually a lot of her romantic entanglements through say like high school and onward. And she ends up going to Smith College to get a degree in English and things go from there. That was all fine. However, and I think this and a lot of my criticism for this book stems from the fact that I did not know anything about Plath. And the more you know about her before you head in, the better off you will be. I have not read The Bell Jar, so it was off-putting to read things like this person and then in parentheses, who was the model for so-and-so in The Bell Jar with no additional context. And I was like, well, I don't know who that is. That's meaningless to me kind of off-putting. There's also a bunch of literary like criticism of her poems here down to like, oh, here she's ex experimenting with dissidents for the first time. I ended up skimming those sections after a while because I don't, I don't really care and I wasn't made to care, unfortunately. Some of her childhood poems were super interesting to me. Maybe it's because it's where my poetry level is, is what she was writing when she was 12. But, and uh, as things went on, I just became, and also like, uh, she would, the author would talk about things way off in the future. And sometimes it was good foreshadowing. Sometimes it was setting me up mentally for what was coming ahead. Other times she would be like, oh, this is a theme that we'll see in her aerial poems. And that also was kind of off-putting. So there's that. And then, and this also, again, stems to the fact that I don't know anything about Plath. I didn't know that she had a suicide attempt 
earlier and that she was placed in a mental institution and that she had electroshock therapy in a sketchy place with zero anesthesia and how horrifying that must have been and she had sketchy psychiatric advice because this is the 50s psychiatry was not in a good place in the 1950s and that was horrifying to read and it should have been horrifying to read and I'm glad it was horrifying to read but I wasn't expecting it so I was like whoa and then as the book went on I realized that I was not enjoying it that if I were not reading it for the prize I would have DNF'd it a long long time ago but I still should probably know something about Plath and of course I need to finish the book for the prize and something Robert has said is that uh, you don't have to read every page necessarily if you're getting along with it you can skim or hate read as you must that's why I did I did look at every page but when I saw that it was an analysis of poetry I skipped it when I saw that it was something that I didn't care about I just slipped through. I usually read the first sentence of each paragraph and decided if that was something I wanted to read. There were some parts that I was very interested in. Um, moving to a new place, for example, or um, at the very, what the very end of her life was like. Her publication stuff I found super interesting as well. But other things, I just found myself flipping pages on the e-reader and being at peace with that. So this is the kind of book where I can say, if you know stuff about Plath, this might be great for you. You might really dig into this the same way that I really liked the Malcolm X biography because I had just read his autobiography and it was filling in all kinds of holes for me. I suspect that this book is similar. However, if you have no framework to begin with and no real interest, you might do better with something shorter first. I don't know, like she criticizes some of the other biographers for their non-feminist lens and I think that's done rightly so I don't know who to read next uh, at a shorter length or just to skim through this one like I did but unfortunately it wasn't for me so this was rather clearly at the bottom of the group so let's see how the rest of my rankings end up sliding into place number five I put a promised land and when we get this late in the book two prize almost every book is amazing I mean even Red Comet while it's not my book, I see why other people will love it and how it got this far. So I just want to get that out of the way. I'm not saying these books are bad. They just happen to rank below other ones in the group. A Promise Land by Barack Obama is solid. I really like his writing. It's another one where I learned that there were some parts that I could skip. For Obama, it was like thanking people almost, just listing lots of names. I learned to get through that, but I loved reading about his early political career, um, things about his home life, like with uh, his girls and with Michelle. Definitely need to read Becoming at some point. But compared to the other books here, it was good, but it wasn't standout. For number four, I put After the Last Border. If you saw the round where I judged this initially, I, I'll leave a link down below if you haven't, because I went on a ride with this book. All different kinds of feelings for it, going from sheer suspicion to really getting along with the narrative nonfiction writing. And my feelings for this have kind of settled. It's like I recognize that for a lot of people, especially white people and people who are not familiar with the refugee system in the United States, this will be wonderful and great. But it's not quite what I was looking for in this kind of book. And there are some things that would change. There are some things just it was a good. Some people will be a perfect book to read. But yeah, so this ended up going in fourth. Books three, two, and one are the ones that I'm effectively recommending go through to the next round. And the earlier books, that was easy. Four, five, six, no problem. One, two, three, I had an incredibly hard time ranking, in part because in some ways they're so similar, in some ways they're so different. To remember, we have Inferno, which is about a woman's journey with um, postpartum psychosis. And then we have Hidden Valley Road, which is about a family where set, I think seven of the kids ended up having schizophrenia and that's narrative nonfiction. And then we have uh, Conditional Citizens, which is part memoir, part essay about immigration and who and who isn't, who is and isn't seen as a full citizen of the United States in particular, but it goes more broadly than that. So, I mean, two of those are about mental disease. Two of them are memoirs, at least in part. And how do I rank these? And if I rank them a certain way, like what if I rank the memoir first? Does that mean that I am saying that memoir is, you know, better, more important than narrative nonfiction? Does the degree of difficulty matter? Because the narrative nonfiction definitely has the most 
research and the most leg work and probably took the longest to do, does that deserve to be rewarded? Does that make it worth more than, say, Conditional Citizens, which does an amazing job of blending the facts and the essays part with stories from her own life that illuminate that information even better? And it was really hard. And I'm not sure I can articulate the differences well and how I ended up ranking them. This ranking might change in six months once my opinions of the book settles. It's just the way it is with this kind of prize. And yeah, so anyway, number three ended up being Conditional Citizens. The writing in here is wonderful. One thing that may have ended up costing it a little bit is that I didn't learn anything, but I don't want to say that's not like I'm holding that against the book either. Uh, especially because her memoir parts really illuminate what's going on in there. It is the book that I read fastest um, out of the three that I ended up reading in the past two months. And I don't... <sighs> the other books on here feel like more of an accomplishment. That might be the way to put it for this one. The other two, one of them was an accomplishment of personal in a personal way and the other one is an accomplishment in a research way and this one while very good didn't reach that level of this is an accomplishment it is a very solid very good four star book but yeah it just didn't tip over one and two were the hardest for me especially because it's now narrative fiction versus memoir i ended up putting inferno in number two it's really good the writing is really good seeing what it's like in her head as she's having this these psychotic episodes and not really being sure of what reality is because we are in her head and so there's that the only things i can think to knock off against this are one of those personal is that i'm a medical sort i wanted more information about the medical side that didn't come at the same time that's not what she was getting at so i respect that um, I also respect that this must have been very difficult to write about such a personal thing, especially in the realm of pregnancy and motherhood, where there's so many social stigmas and things that she may be dealing with now that it's a common fact that she went through this thing. So, so much respect there. And it is an accomplishment the way that she was able to put her life onto paper like this. This is the book that I read fastest that I had previously read for other rounds. And yeah, but there's just, I'm, and this is what's killing me the most, is because I feel like the reason that I have put Hidden Valley Road in first is because, maybe because it's more comprehensive, because you were looking at not only the life of this one family and everything that they had gone through, and all the research and that kind of stuff that went into that, but we also look at psychiatry and how that changed over time and what kind of treatments were in vogue at certain points and what that meant for people with schizophrenia and all of that. So it is more comprehensive and there was a lot more research done for it and I'm in awe of how he was able to pull some things together. The one point with that that I'm not as thrilled with is how some real life events were used for, felt like kind of like shock value in certain bits that I was not a fan of, but it's hard to come up with any other things against that. So if I could, I would put Inferno and Hidden Valley Road as a tide for first, because they're just so different that I have a super hard time telling you why I put Hidden Valley Road first. And this came up in a previous round, didn't it? Where it's like, how well did the person set out what they meant to do? And these, both of these excel at it. So I, I don't feel great about putting Hidden Valley Road first. I don't feel super confident. I don't feel like I can defend it all that well. I feel like I might have different reasoning in a week, but ballots need to go in. So here we are. I will be judging the finals. I don't know how I could tear myself away at this point. And the most books I would have to read are three. And I've already read most of the Chunksters. I think the only Chunkster left is Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. But other than that, they're shorter books. and. I may only have to read one, depending on what gets through the other group. So we'll see. So I will be continuing my vague reviews and wrap ups, but they will be ultra vague, depending on how many books I have left in the group. And yeah, so I would love to hear your thoughts on these books, on any of the vloggy bits, on anything at all down in the comments below. You, of course, you're welcome to say hi. And if you are not subscribed to this channel, please do so. I wrap up all of my reading. There's bunches of nonfiction in there as well as other kinds of fiction, romance, and thought-provoking other things. Like I had a discussion on content warnings that you may want to check out. So please do that. Thank you for watching. 
and I will see you in the next video. Bye!